My name is Trinidad Gonzalez. I'm a history and Mexican American studies instructor here at South Texas College. I'm also a co-founder of Refusing to Forget, although I should note that I stepped down from the board last year. So this is the work we did for us. Uh, I'm a descendant as well, I should say. I'm a descendant of Palino Cerda. Well, my mom would actually talk more about my great-grandmother, Santos Gamboa, because you have to understand that these individuals are not individuals. They're husbands, they're fathers, they're grandchildren, they're children. And when they were killed, there's an aftermath that the family has to deal with. In this case, my great-grandmother, Santos Gamboa, packed up her family and moved to Edinburgh. My grandmother was a year and about four months old. Her father was killed. Her oldest child, she named after him, Paulino. This is our story through our names and through what we we share with each other, right? So we're going to now transition to the session for the, the round table. Up here, Margaret, who is the director of the Bullock Museum, and Monica, who couldn't make it down today, but she's streaming in. So I'm Ben Johnson. I teach in the history department at Loyola University, Chicago, and um, I'm one of the members of Refusing to Forget and the author of uh, Revolution in Texas, a book that looks at many of these events. My name is uh, John Moran Gonzalez um, uh, from Brownsville, grew up there, and I teach in the English department at the University of Texas at Austin. I'm a former director of the Center for Mexican American Studies there, and my book about this topic or the aftermath of this topic is called uh, Border Renaissance, uh, the Texas Centennial and the Emergence of Mexican-American Literature. Buenas noches a todos. Good evening. I'm Sonia Hernandez. I'm an associate professor in the Department of History at Texas A&M University and College Station, but I'm a, a Valleyite and I'm just uh, thrilled um, to, to be here. I'll pass it on to Margaret. Good evening, everyone. I'm Margaret Cook. I'm the director of the Bullock Texas State History Museum here in Austin. Um, I might be able to tell from my accent that I'm not a native Texan. I migrated from Wisconsin via Chicago, Philadelphia, and St. Louis before coming here. I also serve currently as the president of the Texas Association of Museums. And when we first started this project, when it first came to the Bullock, I wasn't director yet. I was um, just director of exhibit. So it's my pleasure to be with you tonight. I'm sorry I can't be there in person. Hello. Good evening, everyone. I, like Margaret, am so sad not to be with you in person. I'm thrilled um, that the exhibit is traveling and that South Texas College is the first host. My name is Monica Martinez. I'm a, an associate professor of history at the University of Texas at Austin. I'm the author of the book, The Injustice Never Leaves You, um, the history of anti-Mexican violence in Texas, and a proud co-founder of Refusing to Forget. And I'm, I'm so, again, thrilled uh, that this event is taking place, that the exhibit is up and will be up for a month, and that people will have a chance um, to travel to see it. So really, uh, the story begins right after the U.S.-Mexican War ended with the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo in 1848, in which the Nueces Strip, which of course includes the valley, became part of the United States. The Rio Bravo became the Rio Grande and the border. Even after that, this part of South Texas really remained a part of Mexico in a cultural sense, economically, culturally, and linguistically. So when you spoke of the the, the capital, you weren't talking about D.C., you were talking about the epic. You paid your taxes in dollars, but you paid your groceries in pesos. And then, of course, everybody spoke Spanish. So this remained for 50 years, you know, up until the early 20th century, when in 1904, a railroad connection came not from the south, but from the north, from Corpus Christi. That began the integration of the valley into the U.S. economy, brought down many, many Midwesterners mostly, but lots of uh, folks from outside the valley who then began to change the nature of the valley socially, uh, politically, and economically. Essentially, what happened was that there was a pretty rapid turnover uh, of land from Tejano, largely cattle raising, into corporate agribusiness. All of this happened in a very quickly. And now that there was a way to transport agricultural goods up north via the railroad, I think the other things to keep in mind is that the changes weren't simply economic. There were political changes so that these newcomers thought that politics in the uh, southern tip of Texas was corrupt. And so they essentially found ways of instituting, disenfranchising the, the Texas Mexican uh, voters, instituting things like the poll tax or literacy tests, not in, not in Spanish, but in English, instituting whites-only primaries in the Democratic primary, which was, of course, the only party of the, of the state at that time. Socially speaking, all of a sudden, uh, Tejanos, Texas Mexicans, found themselves 
being segregated, racially segregated, Jim Crow style, uh, in public accommodations and in juries and uh, all kinds of other places where they once, you know, took it for granted their role in the democratic process of governance. They were getting displaced from this. Needless to say, all of this led to an atmosphere that was racially charged precisely because of these new discriminations and displacements. Then, of course, there was the context of the Mexican Revolution. Thank you, John, for that, because it's really important to point out this larger history. For a long time, if you look at the literature during this time period, the main cause or the, the reason that was given for this extra legal killing of Mexican origin people was the Mexican Revolution. The Mexican Revolution of 1910 does intensify the situation. It, it, it exacerbates the situation that it was already a delicate one, but it was not the main cause. What the Mexican Revolution did, and just um, to give you a little bit of background, one of the bloodiest revolutions of the 20th century, there is a series of revolutions that break out in different corners of the globe, Russian Revolution, the Chinese Revolution, the Irate first Iranian Revolution. So there are all these ideas that are circulating in, uh, in different parts of the world, and certainly in Mexico, about uh, political rights, about suffrage, about labor rights, about access to land, and not just land, but fertile or arable land. And so a lot of these ideas appeal to Mexican and Mexican-Americans on this side of the border. But that did not mean that everyone was picking up an arm and joining some revolutionary faction. And so what happens is that the Mexican Revolution was invoked as the main cause or the reason to then grow uh, suspicious of anyone who basically looked like a Mexicano. And so what we have during this time period is the liberal use of the term of the label bandit. So if you were um, someone who was, you know, of course, Mexicano, particularly that of, of working class background. So, you know, the role of class here is really important. You could be labeled a potential suspect a bandido, a bandit. And so what we have, this is happening. We have, you know, commercial ag, which begins to push the Mexican origin population to these kinds of jobs that are tied to stoop labor so much that by the 1920s, by the end of the 1920s, the majority of the Mexican American population is engaged in stoop labor, oftentimes working in land that they had once owned or their family had once owned. And so the Mexican Revolution is sort of like the perfect storm to then further use it as an example to eliminate people who were seen as obstacles to state progress. And this this is when, you know, we have a gross, almost, you know, indiscriminate manner in terms of how people were were killed. All of this is going on. So there is a, an excuse used by politicians and leaders to call for the militarization of the border. So beginning in 1913, you have Governor Oscar Colquitt sending some thousand National Guard members to the border to protect it and to safeguard it. Fast forward a couple of years, by 1916, you have President Woodrow Wilson sending thousands of troops. You're talking about people who are coming from different parts of the country with very little knowledge about Mexican and Mexican American culture. And so there's almost, uh, well, there's, you know, forget about um, distinguishing between those who held citizenship and those who did not. That doesn't really exist at this time period. And they're all sort of lumped together. And anybody who appears as a, a suspect, it can be easily labeled a bandit. And so it's very common to see if we look at primary sources of the period, just descriptions of, quote, 10 bandits killed with very little disregard for the lives of those people. It really is a tragic moment that gives authority to those in power, like members of the Texas Rangers, like local sheriffs and other members of law enforcement to indiscriminately label them bandits. I'll just briefly add for the context, the governor person who created Company D of the Rangers down here specified, and this is in the testimony of the Canasir, specified that he would pre-pardon anybody who was charged for murder by the Rangers, right? So he basically told the Rangers, don't worry, you can kill, I'll pardon you if you're charged with murder, right? And so this is what leads to that sort of green lighting of, of the extra legal killings. 
the state, state sanctioned kills, I should say. Uh, the other thing is a lot of people are now finding out who are killed owned land. So this is where we start to see land taken through what's called adverse possession, right? So even though you don't own the land, if you can claim that you've been on the land for two or three years and the owner hasn't pushed you off the land, then you can apply for that land to transfer the title to you. So, and we have in the testimony where a developer actually said, yes, I took a ranger and I told this individual he had to sell to me or the ranger was going to come back and kill him. But that individual actually filed a charge against him. And so he had to back off that sort of rancher. But there are other testimony and news articles that you start to see ranches being vacated where the, the people flee as refugees to Mexico and abandon their lands. And the newspapers are talking about all these abandoned lands out in Cameron and Willis County. That's how that that transfer of land is going to go from individuals who are able to hold on to land. So this idea that they didn't know how to read or they didn't know how to pay the property taxes, is that's a myth. The transfer of land was through adverse possession, which means pushing the people off the land physically. And the governor, again, in the testimony, this is not something on hearsay or made up. The person swore to this. This is what the governor promised the Rangers, a pardon for being charged for murder. You know, there's um, five of us at this point in time. We know quite a bit about these events. In some cases, like Trini, it's from like others in the room, it's from family knowledge. In other cases, it's because we've read books, uh, or in my case, written books. Monica just finished a dissertation on the subject. And what frustrates us is very much what Representative Canales was talking about, that actually you can find out a lot of information about exactly what happened, and yet it's not really out there, right? You go to the Waco, the Hall of Fame for the Texas Rangers in Waco, they don't talk about any of this, so they talk about this as being bandits. The press is writing about anti-Latino violence in the present and doesn't seem to understand that there's a long history of this. So we get together and form an organization, you know, refusing to forget in 2014 um, to try to take advantage of the fact that there's the centennial of these events coming up, right? And it's like a birthday or an anniversary. People might pay more attention to this. And from the beginning, we had in our minds the idea that a museum and museum exhibit might be able to reach an audience that our own articles and books and those of several generations of scholars before us had failed to do so. But we're all professors, right? Like we're not, you know, we don't know how to design a museum exhibit. We don't work in a museum exhibit. I mean, I'm lucky if I, you know, my socks match in the day, right? Like I can't put together this stuff. So we have this conversation. We're like, well, who's going to do this? You know, and we have two counts against us, right? The first one is that we're running pretty late, right? It's already 2014. And the second one is that this stuff is controversial, right? Not everyone wants to know about this history. This is not a history about how awesome we are and how big and strong we are, right? This is a history of things gone terribly bad. So, you know, at some point we had the idea that like the Texas State Archives is downtown. They have a floor. They put up documents sometime. Maybe they would just give us some cases and we could put out the Canales hearings and a couple of pictures and write some text. I mean, I think this is my idea. It was a really half-baked idea. And I called the director of the archives and she's basically like, what are we talking about? about it. we don't do that and you don't really know what you're doing she's like you should call margaret at the bullock i was like oh the bullock and this is kind of exciting on the one hand right it's the premier museum i'm not just saying this because margaret's listening it's obviously the premier history museum in texas it's got a great location right between the capital and and ut austin gets tens, if not hundreds of thousands of visitors a year. They bring through all sorts of school classes. Their exhibits are great, right? They really know how to use artifacts. They can borrow stuff from all over the place. They have high production values, right? It's like going to a, you know, a, a Hollywood movie, right? It also makes us nervous from our perspective. And other scholars had criticized some of the early years of the Bullock as telling a bit of an Anglo-centric story about Texas, a bit of a feel good, you know, oh, Texas is awesome kind of story. So we even wondered, you know, would they want it? Was this something that they would want to touch? And if we brought an idea of an exhibit to these things, would they make changes and water down our message? Would they remove the list of names that, for example, was read here? Would they remove, we have names of rangers, we use words in the text, you know, we use words in our books like murder. Would that be gutted? And even if the Bullock did right by us, like this is a state institution, and we know something about the people who are running the state. So we were kind of excited, but also nervous about this. I remember Monica and I having a long prep conversation for my conversation with Margaret, and she can tell her side of that story, but they were able to speak effectively to our concerns and acknowledge them and also state eloquently why they were interested in this exhibit. I mean, we we were nervous all along the way. And I think at every stage in the development of the, of the project thought that maybe it could be canceled. <laughs> and so we were so thrilled to, to work with Margaret and the team at the Bullock to have the opportunity 
opportunity to collaborate and to be real collaborators, you know, to have team meetings where we were all in the room together as a, as a refusing to forget team of scholars, but then also with the museum staff that had this whole set of skills, you know, from the digital to the collector specialist, the, the object specialist, the, the specialists that develop programming for education for teachers and think about how is a fourth grader going to travel and move through this space. And so we were just really thrilled at the opportunity to collaborate with the Bullock and also something that I think was important that I saw and was able to encourage the team, like this could be really a tremendous opportunity and have a great impact, was participating in a panel session that the Bullock hosted on the history of the Ku Klux Klan in Texas. And it was one of the most riveting conversations um, that I participated in as an academic with a public audience, but it was truthful and it was accurate and it was searing and it was generative. And so that participating in that conversation before the life and death on the border exhibit came together really kept me hopeful. Part of what we were also nervous about was the different audiences that we wanted to reach with the exhibit. So on the one hand, we were thinking about people who had never heard this history, um, members of the public, of the Texas public who'd never heard it and were going to learn it from the first time. But we were also thinking about, and so that included just general members of the public, teachers, journalists that we knew were going to be learning a lot from attending or visiting the exhibit. But also we were thinking about people who did know the story, who did know the history, had learned the history from their families, from their loved ones. We were thinking about what was it going to mean for a descendant to visit the exhibit. And so for us, we were making sure that for people who did know the history, that they were going to be able to witness the first time that a state institution was acknowledged this period of state sanction racial terror, and that we would do justice to the history to tell it truthfully, but also to make sure that we were bringing to life the lives that were interrupted by this violence. So that was, as a historian, thinking about the importance of reaching audiences beyond just the book. Not everybody has time to read a book that's over 300 pages. Not everybody can afford to buy a history book. Not everybody has access to a college classroom that teaches this history. And so it was really so important for us to collaborate with the Bullock, but also say that we had conversations as a team with descendants like Norma Longoria Rodriguez and like Benita Alvarado, who were descendants of people who were murdered in the early 20th century during this period of violence. And they were asking in our commemorative efforts how we were going to collaborate with state institutions. And I remember Norma Longoria Rodriguez telling me, you know, very clearly one time, we've been memorializing our family. We've been preserving the history. We've helped to preserve the archives. It's time for the state to participate. And so so this was really a profound moment of opportunity for the Bullock to show leadership in how to have these truthful conversations about the past, even when they're difficult. Bringing back a lot of memories as you're talking for sure about um, the many conversations that we had together. You might get from what's been said so far that a state institution isn't always a trusted institution, right, for whatever its history has been. But we are not experts here in any field here at the Bullock Museum. We tend to be generalists, which requires us to bring in the experts to work with, right? So on the one on one hand, this collaboration wasn't unusual for us. What was a bit different about it is that we were very conscientious about um, the multiple audiences that we had and the stakeholders. And by stakeholders, I mean not just those who are providing the funding, um, donations, or state appropriations, or anything like that for the Bullock to function, but those stakeholders that have an investment in that history because the history to them is very personal and it's very human. And in this case, it was very painful. And so there is an additional responsibility on our shoulders to make sure that we're not re-victimizing either those who have been lost or the descendants themselves, and that we are providing context for a history that may be hard to look at, may be hard to hear or see, especially when you have something that is so little known. And that was one of the things that intrigued us the most about this story is that in stone on our building, the story of Texas, and there are beautiful, wonderful stories of Texas, and there are painful, hurtful stories of Texas that we learn from, and that there have been positive outcomes. And it's important for us to pause and reflect and think about what that means for us as human beings and what it might mean 
for the future. When we got this call, we have a process in place here at the Bullock for vetting ideas that come, they come from everywhere. I get questions every week from people say, hey, the Bullock should do this, or do you want this traveling exhibit or whatever? So we actually have a procedure and process in place where we vet those ideas and they go through multiple stages. And the first thing that any idea has to be able to uh, meet in terms of criteria is, is it related to our mission? That was a no-brainer with looking at this topic. Is it artifact-based? As a museum, that is the starting point for us is the artifacts. Can we do it in the time frame? Do we have the budget? Do we have it, the human resources and the bandwidth and the marketing ability to do it? Is there an audience that will gain from this? And as we went through all of those questions and talked with our administration and our the team as a whole, we realized that we had to be very sensitive in our approach and our ability to listen and our ability to grasp the history that we would be stewarding. And as we went through every stage of that on our end and continued to work with our advisors, it revealed itself, the exhibit revealed itself. And we'll be sharing a little bit more about that actual production. So I mentioned that for us at the Bullock, it starts with the artifacts, right? And this was the main artifact that was the base of this. It's hard to deny history when you have three volumes of public testimony admitted to the legislature that records the violence that had occurred. Heard. And we worked with the Texas Library and Archives, which had these in their collections in a way that would be respectful of the artifact itself. The continued preservation of these is a goal of the archives. So we looked at multiple ways of displaying it, right? But getting back to the heart of the matter, it's it's this. This is the tangible evidence that there is a record of where this history doesn't begin, but it is undeniable. Right. And so that was the key element for us. Out of this, these books, you didn't know what they were. They're just glue bound pages, right? Until you know what they are. But out of that, we developed this exhibition with the help of the advisors and combing archives across the state and listening to the testimonies of descendants of what they heard whispered around dining room tables and growing up and was in their DNA of having had to live with this and with their ancestors having lived with this. So Monica mentioned one of the audiences, right? Or these general audiences, people who haven't heard this history before and um, need a context, right? If we just jumped into the violence, there would without a doubt be people who would walk away. It would be too much for them. It wouldn't be something that they would be able to comprehend. We wanted to introduce the humanness, the lives of real people that were along the border, living lives, getting married. This beautiful wedding gown is one example of that. There's a gorgeous comb there as well. Being able to give you a sense and, and draw you in because these are people who are, they have children, they have uncles and aunts and grandfathers and, you know, a way in which people who hadn't experienced this in their lives could begin to relate to actual human beings from the past and not just a narrative or a text. So we used a lot of photographs. It was a bilingual exhibition, which was also important for it. And um, it was in this third floor rotunda. So if you essentially went through our core galleries, you would go through three floors of our Texas History Galleries and you would come out into this gallery. And as you walked around the rotunda, Tunda area, you got this context starting from, you know, the landscape, the border, La Frontera, to be able to get a sense of this space we were talking about. When you're stuck in a museum, you don't know, lose all sense of place. And so it was very important for us to keep bringing it back to the land, ranches, the workers, the people that had been invested in this landscape, and then take you through that process of discrimination and racism that had been perpetrated um, against them as you went around the gallery. So you can see there are these wonderful family photos, right? There's family quilts. There continues to be this narrative of real people that weaves its way through the exhibition. I think that was one of the reasons why it was so well received. We didn't shy away from the language that suited the interpretation. You're shot in the back, that is murder. So again, brought out the real people and talked about those identified cases. And we used the testimony as well. And we used the oral histories that had been provided so that we could make sure that what we were 
talking about was accurate and vetted and made sense. And I will say that all of the artifacts in this exhibition were on loan to us. So people trusted us as a state museum to be able to care for and accurately represent their stories. And that is throughout the Bullock Museum. The Bullock Museum does not own any artifacts on its own. Unlike other museums, everything that you see has been offered to us by the graciousness of people or institutions who are entrusting us with their story. And that is something that we take very seriously. Here you can see how we ended up showcasing the legislative testimony, right? Because of the fragility of the paper and the books and the light and the space and everything, we couldn't open them. But that's a pretty significant look right there. And you've got three massive volumes stacked on top of each other. But Texas State Library and Archives, and you can go online and find this if you didn't already know it, has digitized all of the testimony. So we use digital media in order to be able to highlight that and link to it. And you can see that back behind the wall. Now we could have ended the exhibition there, but does that help people see what came out of it? How does that leave them feeling? And we decided we needed to take the story further after the hearings. So we began to focus on the aftermath of this, about the Mexican-American community coming together, the founding of Blue Lock. We talked about the culture of the music and, and culture and artistry that began to come out of this violence and this trauma. And you can see we even introduced music um, that sometimes was a men, it was sometimes it was just very powerful response to being traumatized. And so we had that in the gallery as well. And so the exhibition ended on the aftermath and, and some positive forces that came out of this. Not that it was the end of it or the most absolute wonderful thing that happened, but we talked about community coming together. And so you have this full narrative of kind of before what's leading up to it, during the trauma, the hearings afterwards, and then this future that began to create and herald life in a way that maybe it wouldn't have if people had not come together to remember this, even if they're in their own communities, if even if they couldn't do it on a real public scale at the time. So in terms of working with descendants, they were important stakeholders for us to collaborate with on all of our um, public history projects, whether it was the collaboration with the exhibit with the Bullock Museum or with the Texas Historical Commission. But for the museum exhibit, descendants were critical to the success of the exhibit, especially for being able to give faces to the names of some of the victims, but also the survivors. And so Norma and Gloria Rodriguez, for example, um, from San Antonio, Texas, shared photographs of Antonio Bazan, of Jesus Bazan, but also of Epigmenia Bazan, Antonia Longoria. And so we were able to share with visitors um, the faces of people who were murdered during this period, Antonio Longoria and Jesus Bazan, but also the widows that lived in the aftermath and the children that survived. And the same thing with the descendants of the Bodendid Massacre, that portrait of Juan Bonilla Flores and his brother Narciso were lent by the Alvarado family from Uvalde. And so those, I remember having conversations with Jenny Cobb, who was on the team at the time, who was looking for objects that had the faces of whether they were photographs or objects that belonged to people who were victims of violence, and she couldn't find any. And so the exhibit had, you know, objects from people's private collections. I remember she was like, I could find hundreds of objects of thousands of objects of the belonging to Texas Rangers, but we can't find objects belonging to families that were impacted directly. And so it really was turning to the descendants that we had relationships with, working relationships with people that I had interviewed for my book that were able, that agreed to, to lend their objects. And the Bullock Museum staff had to do some work to earn their trust. One of the things that they did was digitize the objects Objects. So they took high quality, high resolution photographs to help preserve them. Some of them were featured as online objects for the through the Bullock Museum, but the families were able to take those objects back. And so that was that preservation, that digital preservation was an important contribution for the families. But M Margaret also did a really wonderful thing in inviting the families to come and see and tour the exhibit before it was open to the public. And so they were able to spend time, were able to come and 
in, meet each other, to see each other, but also to see the exhibit. Some of it was still being installed. <laughs> like walking around some ladders and things, but it was a gesture and a recognition that these were families who were sharing precious, precious objects that no museum or archive had bothered to preserve before, um, and that they were finally going to do an act of justice, a restorative justice by putting them on display in the flagship museum of Texas. I'd just like to add that part of the aspect of justice is the dignity of being remembered. And that's why it was important to have descendants participate in producing the photos and the other things that was very important to them, but that they were willing to share so we could get the history out to a wider public, right? But unfortunately, that's our time. I want to thank everybody for attending. And if you haven't had a chance to see the exhibit, please go see the exhibit. It's in the library. They're on the first floor and it's, it goes through the whole area. So thank you very much. Thanks, Margaret. And thanks, Monica.